How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to the Ultimate Darkest Dungeon Tips and Tricks Guide. Something that I hope will help new players and veterans alike. If you're struggling at all with some early strategies or resource management, or maybe you just want to feel more prepared on a given run, I think this video can help you a great deal. I'll have the timestamps ready for you so you can seek out specifically what you feel you need a hand with. There are much more in-depth tutorials on starting out, explaining every minute little mechanic within this game. I can't add anything more to those very exhaustive, very well-made videos, so instead I will assume that you have at least done a tutorial and have some basic understanding of Darkest Dungeon. These tips are going to vary from very simplistic to very complex. I'll do my best to build them up in complexity, while also kind of keeping them thematic. Do the best we can. These tips mostly come from key Reddit users and players of the Darkest Dungeon fanbase. I got permission from each of these authors to include these in this video, and I will be sure to attribute each tip to the relevant author as it comes up. When going on your various adventures, the different dungeons have their own enemies mechanics and considerations to be made. Grabthar had the best breakdown, in my opinion, of how to prepare yourself for each dungeon variation. Always bring someone who can reliably hit backline targets no matter where you go. A minimum of one is necessary, but often you'll want to bring two, as that's typically where priority targets tend to be. Enemies of different dungeons are often thematic. As such, putting team buff trinket emphasis on your team should include disease resist for the warren and bleed resist for the cove. That alone will go a very long way to mitigating the amount of damage over time you incur. Similarly, you might want to flip that on your enemies and know which are most vulnerable in each dungeon. In the Ruins and the Cove, they are weak against Blight, and in the Warrens and the Wield, they are weak against Bleed. Consider something near these loadouts when embarking on each dungeon. There's obviously room to play around with it. It's also good to include a few things to interact with specific curios. In the Ruins, Holy Water, a couple of keys, very few shovels, and one or two antidotes max. In the wield, more shovels, bandages, and medicinal herbs for food salvage. In the cove, bandages. Also a few extra torches, and a few shovels, but mostly bandages. And the warrens, disease cure camping skills, blight resistance, and a couple of shovels, throw in some bandages for good measure. Consider screenshotting and saving this image somewhere handy if you think it's something you'd like to reference semi-regularly. This is like the number one thing I like to have on hand when playing. It's like knowing what is super effective and weak against each other in Pokemon. It just makes it that small amount easier when you know a little bit of what's coming. Rather than telling you specifically how to build a party or who to take with you, the fun of the game is experimenting with that. So those tips should help you choose a party that feels right for you and supplies within your own preferences that'll best match the unique challenges of each dungeon. Claire de Lune used to have a tier list for heroes, but after years of balancing with more to come, any hero can have a valuable role. If you want a few hero or party building tips, there are a few that come courtesy of Reddit's cutest girl here. First and foremost, they agree there are no bad heroes, only bad teams and poor player decisions. Every hero can get you through most of the game easily enough from Radiant to Stygian, and there's more than one viable way to build your teams for every encounter. While there might be an optimal way to go through certain bosses and the like, you don't have to perfectly optimize to beat this game. Any decent team can get the job done, just play however and you'll have fun. A team is typically built around healers, damage dealers, and stunners, with the odd additional role thrown in on occasion like buffers or markers. Stress healers are also of use, especially when you're still learning the ropes, but teams with reliable damage and stuns won't typically need a stress healer. Try fitting in a stress healer into your team as you're learning, but eventually try to experiment by getting around without one. If you want that as a safety, the Jester, the Crusader, Houndmaster, and Flagellant from the Crimson Court DLC can all stress heal your party, while the Leper and Abomination can self-stress heal. Preferably, you should try to avoid being stressed in the first place, but bringing a stress healer in your party gives a good option for recovery. Additionally, should a hero become afflicted, stress healing them back down to zero stress will cure them of their affliction. The best way to deal with stress is avoid. 
learn which enemies deal stress damage, usually the backliners, and target them with stuns and damage to prevent stress from building up at all. If only it was that easy to mitigate real life stress. While we're at it, we can look at some typical health healing options. The Vestal, Occultist, Arbalist, Flagellant, Crusader, Antiquarian, and Plague Doctor. The Vestals are good enough at healing to maintain a party alone. For any non-Vestal party, you'll probably want two healers, or rely on self-healers like the Leper, Houndmaster, Abomination, and Hellion. Early level Vestals can't really keep pace with enemy damage, and are better used as stunners. Although a quick heal can always save you in a pinch, try not to have them carry all the healing duties early on. A lesser team building consideration could be ambush prevention. Anytime you camp, your team risks a 33% chance of being ambushed. If you don't think your team would be able to handle an ambush, try to fit the Crusader, Highwayman, Houndmaster, Occultist, or Vestal into your team with their ambush prevention camping skill equipped. Not a major role for a hero, but a nice bit of utility offered when camping to let your heroes rest without fear of ambush. But generally, if you're risking getting wiped by an ambush, you probably have other concerns that need to be addressed. The Antiquarian looks like a straight up bad hero. Generally, just bad stats and useless seeming skills. But she has two unique passive effects. Firstly, she increases the max amount of gold that can stack in your inventory. Secondly, whenever she directly interacts with a loot-giving curio like a bag or chest, she finds special relics worth a ton of gold. Take her out on a couple of runs every now and again, and you'll never have money issues again. Now let's focus on some nice broad tips that will really sharpen those dungeoneering skills. I'll start a little more basic and ramp up to advanced considerations for dungeon exploring. At the most basic level, you are going to lose heroes, potentially a lot of them. Some due to your mistakes, some from spending too long exploring when you think things are safe, or maybe a combination of bad choices and bad luck. Move on. No matter how attached you were, it happens to all of us. Maybe take a break and reflect. Rage quitting this game is real. If you're getting deeply invested, you might be rattled by that for a couple of days. But do not restart. Deaths largely will not matter unless you're on the max difficulty. Earning your way back to the top will instead be all the sweeter. One of cutest girl here's biggest tips is read and pay attention to everything. The narrator can warn you of what happens when the lights get low. Curios tell you not to stick this thing in that thing. You know, unless you want to die. Your heroes will warn you what a boss fight is about to do to them, and the guild or blacksmith can give some helpful info on how to play a character. A good chunk of players have had their teams wiped because they completely ignored their hero's warning during a boss fight, while others decided to stick a certain something in a certain somewhere despite being clearly told not to. So it's a good idea to just stop, read, pay attention, and consider everything. This is something you're bound to learn through trial and error, but you'll quickly see the common sense in curio interactions. Use holy water on anything religious, keys on anything locked, herbs on anything edible or plant-related, bandages on something that might give you a cut, anti-venom on anything poisonous, and shovels to smash or dig things up. There are a few exceptions, but as with most things in this game, you learn best by doing. Stack up torches to keep torchlight at 75 or higher. There is a sliding scale of risk-reward as you allow your torchlight to decrease. If you drop your torchlight to zero, it gives a bonus to the loot you collect, but it makes everything significantly harder as a trade-off. When you're still new and getting used to the game, stick to 75 plus light instead. You'll earn a bit less, but you'll survive, level up, and live to take on bigger risks in the future. Skip curios initially. Clearing the dungeon and all enemies is your main focus. Then, snuff your torch and loot the curios. The game does not generate loot until the moment it's interacted with, so you can cheese the snuffed torch benefits. This is a super effective way to rake in money if you don't want to give up a slot for the Antiquarian. Do be wary of backtrack fights. Consider saving a few torches till you're almost done backtracking in case a fight does pop up. You will suffer a fair deal of stress at this point too. Hopefully staying well lit on your first pass and avoiding fights in the dark will mitigate that trade-off. 
Consider camping early for scouting and buffs. Scouting is utterly broken. It has been nerfed a little in various updates, but it is still very stackable and prevents some of the most common cases of RNG blowing your game up. Following that up, 95% of complaints about RNG are solved by scouting comboed with speed. Scouting prevents you from being surprised and allows you to plan a route that avoids fights if you want, while speed allows you to go first and stun or kill enemies before they act. At the beginning of each round, the game rolls one d8 dice roll for each hero and monster, which is then added onto their speed stat. Turn order then goes from highest to lowest. So a hero with 10 speed could roll a 1 and be outsped by a 7 speed monster that rolled a 5. If you don't want to run the risk of being outsped, a speed difference of plus 8 ensures your opponent can never outspeed you. However, it is a bit difficult to reliably reach that on most heroes. Hunger tiles are generated when the dungeon is made, and rarely when you re-enter an explored hall. They stay in the same place and don't disappear, so plan around them when you hit one. You're immune to hunger tiles for two rooms after triggering one or after camping. You can change your combat and camping skills mid-dungeon. A lot of people don't know this, but it's a pretty useful thing. For example, in Endless, you can take a battle-limited skill off your bar until it refreshes. Or you can swap skills before a boss fight or camp based on what you need. Remember before we mentioned the Crusader, Highwayman, Houndmaster, Occultist, and Vestal have ambush prevention skills? It's very advantageous to be able to swap these in and out depending on current need. Similarly, you can swap trinkets around using your inventory. Luna likes to swap recovery charms around on no healer runs to boost healing from food and move stress healing trinkets around to maximize camp skill effectiveness. Proper inventory management there opens up so many new party possibilities. Boss fights outside of mini bosses and certain bosses like the Crimson Court or Darkest Dungeon bosses will always spawn at the furthest room from the starting room, counting individual rooms instead of hallway tiles. If you're dealing with a very large map and don't know where to go to reach the boss fight, just look to see where the furthest room is located. Don't worry too much about losing trinkets. Once you've lost enough of them, a certain someone can appear and give you the chance to earn those trinkets back. So now you should be a master of exploring the dungeons. Inevitably, you're gonna get in a scrap or two, so let's look at a few effective battle tips. It should help you understand how to get the most out of your team and turns. You may hear players refer to action economy. This is the idea of getting as much out of every hero's action in a given situation. Don't waste turns on buffing in battles aside from bosses or endless. It's certainly not worthwhile given the pace of fights. Exceptions are things like ballad or command. Ballad from the Jester and Command from Man at Arms. Each apply to the entire party and carries hefty bonuses. That's part of that action economy. You're getting a lot out of an individual skill in each use. Stuns are pretty good, but require some commitment if you want to spam them. That said, stun things when possible. It's good for your action economy. Stunners include the Occultist, Plague Doctor, Abomination, Houndmaster, and Bounty Hunter. You may stun lock dangerous targets until your damage dealers kill them off, or disable low priority targets while you focus down bigger threats. Whatever works best for your party to quickly dispatch the biggest threat. In addition, it could buy an extra round or two for healing. In general, it's a good idea to target position 3 and 4 first, as they are usually stress dealers, which is more difficult to heal than health. While focusing damage there, stun the front two enemies, who are typically damage dealers. If you cannot stun both, focus fire to kill one so you don't have to fend off two damage dealers. Be aware that the game gives a 40% stun resist buff to enemies coming out of a stun to stop you from stun locking. Understanding some of the math behind the game could go a long way. Hit chance equals accuracy minus dodge. So 90 accuracy against 10 dodge gives an 80% hit chance. The game constantly adds a hidden extra 5% hit chance bonus to all hero and enemy attacks, turning that 80 into an 85 instead. This also means that reaching at least 95% hit chance guarantees all attacks will land. That hidden 5% pushes it up to 100. 
So make sure to stack accuracy trinkets, quirks, or buffs to try to reach that 95% threshold. Protection is more reliable than dodge, but dodge can also make the game a joke if you can stack 100 plus, potentially with the Antiquarian, Houndmaster, and Man at Arms. Damage is worse than crit point for point, but is much easier to stack since most trinkets and buffs give significantly more damage than crit. Guarding is super overpowered. The protection nerfs did help with that, but enemies now also target marks more than before. So withstand or bulwark and especially defender are amazing at drawing enemy fire. Healing in the early phases of a fight is generally bad. When you're down to one to two enemies, that's when you heal. Ideally before stall timers kick in. The stall timer is to combat dragging out a fight. If there is only one enemy left, this timer begins, and in a few turns you will accumulate stress and enemy reinforcements arrive. So either get it down to one, heal and end things, or get the enemies down to two and take a little bit more time with those considerations. Some recent changes to Vestal have made her healing ridiculously good, so you can now get away with it mid-fight, but try not to rely on this too hard, as it generally makes you take more hits and stress overall. Don't stand around waiting for your heroes to get wiped. The retreat option is almost always available. Even when badly injured, it's always better to let your heroes live to fight another day. There is a small chance for a retreat to fail, but your chance of retreating increases with every failed attempt. Keep in mind if playing Stygian difficulty, you can get a game over by allowing 12 heroes to die. In Blood Moon, it's raised to 16, since they're more likely to die from their curse. It is not worth contributing to that tally. Think of dungeons as a marathon and battles as a sprint. It is not sustainable to suffer massive damage and stress in every battle. Minimize these factors rather than maximizing damage by preventing as many enemy actions as possible. Stun and kill enemies whenever you can, prioritize those that have a remaining action. We now know how to effectively explore dungeons, and a few considerations to weigh in battle, so how about a few quick things outside of the dungeons? Upgrade the stage, coach, blacksmith, and guild first, as they're the most important buildings available in the hamlet, providing you a constant supply of heroes along with the means to upgrade them. Other buildings like the Sanitarium and Nomad Wagon aren't worth upgrading until mid or late game, while the Abbey, Tavern, and Survivalist shouldn't be or won't be used nearly often enough to be worth upgrading at all. Ideally, you're managing things well enough that they're not particularly needed. If you're playing without districts, you need to rely a little more on the usual upgrades, and if so, it's better to upgrade the Abbey for stress relief rather than the Tavern because the Tavern shares heirloom costs with the guild. The Crimson Court DLC adds districts, which are especially important for late game planning. They are expensive, but can offer some major buffs. Here's a recommended prioritization. The best districts to get are the Cartographer's Camp, Sanguine Vintners, and Puppet Theater. The Cartographer's Camp makes the whole game easier. More loot and improved scouting, that will go a long way. The Vintner means you don't have to gather blood. That's crucially important for managing the curse. Puppet Theater provides ideal stress relief in town. That essentially means you never need to use stress heal activities again, meaning that if you have the Crimson Court DLC bought and installed, at a minimum you should be activating these districts. The bank is a trap. It is going to eat up your heirlooms. If you have no money, it won't help you. If you have a lot of money, you don't need it. All it does is mildly reduce the late game grind. And as we established earlier, there are far better ways to earn gold. The Color of Madness adds a few districts of their own. They can be fun, but are ultimately not that big of a deal. Focus elsewhere first, and if you don't have access to them, you're not missing out on much. I want to round out this video with some BIG ADVANCED TIPS! It is my hope that even veteran players will have gotten something out of this video at this point, but if not, these are the most big brain considerations of the whole thing. Farm apprentice shamblers for trinkets using level 2 heroes. Shamblers have 5 ancestral trinkets they can drop, including the much sought after map, candle, and scroll. They can be dropped from any shambler difficulty so there's no need to fight the big ones. Shamblers can replace any enemy encounter when your torchlight is at zero. Bring someone with Repost, the Highwayman or Man at Arms, and some AoE. Then you can be less concerned with shufflers. For Endless Mode, Battle Ballad is basically a cheat code. Vestal plus Jester is a solid backline if you find yourself stuck. 
If you're gonna go Dark Runs above Apprentice, I highly recommend both High Scouting and Repost. Repost in case you get shambled, Scouting so you don't get constantly surprised and shuffled. A lot of people use Jester as a dedicated stress healer. Jester is a glass cannon buffer with every attack and move fueling his damage in Finale. He is a third or fourth slot character where he can buff and stress heal while buffing himself. And as the classic RPG rule goes, never focus a tank. He is the character that gets rid of the tank. Once the enemy party is weak enough that only the tank or boss remain, instead of slowly chipping down his HP, your Jester, who has been buffing himself the whole encounter for just this one attack, moves himself forward by dagger attack or solo, and one-shots, or at a minimum, inflicts huge damage to that tank or boss. While trinkets are helpful throughout the game, having well-equipped, blinged-out teams without any wasted slots will go a long way. It's not a bad idea to target missions solely on what will deliver you the best trinkets. Others may disagree with this, but choosing trinkets that boost speed first, damage second, and accuracy third is generally beneficial. There are exceptions, but it's hard to go wrong prioritizing those stats in that order. It's a good idea to carry around medicinal herbs. Not only are they good for many curio interactions, but they can also cure trap debuffs. While they can't do anything for monster-inflicted debuffs, those accumulated from traps shouldn't be ignored. They can be incredibly crippling and last 12 rounds. Trying to ride out a penalty that big is a huge risk. Be mindful of disease management with the sanitarium. It will remove all diseases from a hero in a single stay. So if you're carrying one or two weaker diseases, you might want to wait to make a trip after acquiring something more harmful to save time and money. You want that hero to be out of commission for as little time as possible. Maybe you just have to grit and bear some minor debuffs in the meantime. The sanitarium can also remove negative quirks, but if you are feeling bold, you may instead farm long cove runs. Using medicinal herbs on eerie coral curios will allow you to remove a negative quirk. If this is your goal on a long run, do not waste the herbs on other curios along the way, as several of them may have negative effects that will end things quickly. Most perks are relatively insignificant, but definitely target the removal of forced interaction quirks as quickly as possible. These are usually named like Blank Mania, there are a few named differently, and specifically Photomania and Nymphomania are not forced interaction quirks, but these are specific quirks that force curio interactions without the player's input. Heroes have a chance to trigger these, often resulting in diseases, damage, and occasionally looting the found items. Your party will suffer greatly from these, and you'll miss out on lots of gold and items in the long run. And with that, that is every tip I can possibly give at this point. We obviously have the release of Darkest Dungeon 2 around the corner, so I figured now is a good time for this video. There's probably some renewed interest, maybe people checking out this series for the first time. I don't know how much of this is going to apply to that sequel, but if you become a more well-rounded, more confident dungeon diver, then hey, I'm sure it won't hurt. Please let me know if you have any tips of your own down in the comments. I'd love to know if you're a new player who's been debating playing the game and now feels confident enough to get into it, or maybe a long-term veteran who learned something new. I would really love to hear that. Huge thank you to the patrons of the channel. This style of video isn't something I really have ever done, but I just love this game and wanted more people to feel that it was accessible. So please go check it out. Thank you all so much for watching. I wish you guys the best of luck in your dungeoneering, and I hope to see you again soon.